Welcome along to What A Shout, the world-class weekend preview show that brings you all the best bets for the great action we've got in the next couple of days. We'll also be looking at the big shouts. We'll be paying tribute to some of Yorkshire's great horses to come inside with Ebor Week. And we've got a very special guest. First of all, though, delighted to be joined in the studio by Paul Keeley. Kills back among the winners yesterday. How are you feeling as we approach the halfway stage of the yeah, Ebor right. Festival? Yeah, I'll back Gold Wand. Um, bit of a big drifter, probably because... Um, the favourite had been second to Alpinista, who was second to Love uh, earlier on. That sort of got smashed in. Um, there was a couple that were like second on my list that won yesterday that annoyed me a little bit. But I mean, it's nice to be among the winners, and I've had a I've had a stack of seconds this week, so I'm knocking on the door. Confident going into the weekend. Uh, I can say confident. I look at Saturday's cars; it's so hard, so competitive. But uh, we'll be having a little go. And from our sponsors, Bet365, Pat Cooney. Now then, Pat, two days in and only two favourites have won at York. So it's a bookies festival so far, isn't it? So far, so good at the names, Maya, but uh, not too far away at Chester last night was pretty grim. Nine races, eight winning favourites. So uh, be aware of that when, you know, when we're... we're We've come to the bragging rights. It was a tough evening last night. Oh, dear. Put that violin away. Come <laughs> off it, man. Now then, last and very much most, we are delighted to welcome to What A Shout two-time champion jockey Paul Hannigan. Paul, it's great to have you along. How are you feeling, my friend? Great to be on. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, yeah, Excellent. very well. Feeling good. Thank you. Well, you must be because you've just come back from a horrible six-week, six-month break with a broken back. Just started riding again this week. First of all, how good is it to be back in the saddle? Yeah, it's just uh, great to be back. I'm in 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 the saddle, um, back with your with your peers, back in the weighing room. You know, back to a bit of normality. So uh, yeah, it's 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 very nice. Well, talking about back, obviously it was the back that caused the problem six months ago at Newcastle in February. Tell us what happened. Yeah, it was uh, it was a bit of a gloomy night, as you can imagine, at Newcastle in in, in the middle of February, Bruce, and um, just generally my, my my horse clipped heels, uh, probably going about uh, forty mile an hour, um, which is not ideal, and came down, um, and I actually fractured my T three, T four, and T six, and uh, it was a it was a it was a scary moment, as I kind of knew it was a bad one straight away because I couldn't get up. So um, it, it, it wasn't good. Oh, my goodness me. And um, obviously, you know, you've, you've had that really anxious moment there. At what point did you think, you know, I'm actually going to be all right here? Because, I mean, that just, uh, you know, a broken back at 40 miles an hour it just sounds horrific. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you've got rushed to hospital straight away. And you, you can imagine um, the thoughts that are going through your head when you can't really move much of your body at all. Um, you know, I thought I'm I'm in big trouble here. It was only really later on down down the line where I kind of knew that, that there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and after seeing, you know, a specialist that did wonders, um, that's when I thought I've, I've got a chance, a little chance of making it back. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. Have, I've, I've gone. Yeah, you have no fear, you guys. Though. I mean, you broke your back. You're going to be laying there thinking, you know, maybe, like, you know, this is it. Like, you know, and yet... You can't wait to get back in the saddle and get on there. What's the matter with you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's what it, I think it's bred into us, to be honest. Um, you know, I think that I think the work rate that 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 we do and 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 the love of the game. You know, I've been riding now for 20, 22, 23 years now. So, you know, it's not just your job; it's your life. And how much, Paul, of a help was the the brilliant new facility at Jack Berry House for you in your rehab? I can't stress enough, Bruce. I mean, I mean, luckily it's on the doorstep for me in Malton as well, a Jack Berry house. Um, I, I wouldn't have been in this position if it wasn't for them. Uh, you've also got the Injured Jockeys Fund, um, Dr. Jerry Hill, who do, who's doing a, a great job. So I, I owe a lot to a lot of people. Well, I mean, if you if you are watching this and you listen to, to that story, then perhaps if you back a winner in the next couple of days, it wouldn't be a bad idea to send a few quid to the Injured Jockeys Fund in Jack Berry House. They are absolute, you know, they're, they're the guys that help these brave jockeys get back so quickly. What was it like that first ride back, Paul? I think it was on Monday, wasn't it? Any nerves going into it or was it just like the old proverbial riding a bike, get back in the saddle and away you go? Well, the idea was um, probably to, to, to come back to York, Bruce, um, 
and then my agent uh, had the bright idea to uh, mention about having a blow at uh, Beverly um, the day before. And uh, now Beverly's not for the faint-hearted, especially about 15 runners going into that first bend at about seven furlongs. I can't really say on uh, on, on on live. Uh, pictures what I was thinking of my agent going into that bend on my first ride back, but uh, I'm, I'm I'm glad I did it. You know, I blew a few of the cobwebs away, and um, I think that was probably the the toughest day, and uh, I, I got through it. Well, good for you, Paul. And there's a couple of big landmarks coming up. You're I think you're a couple of dozen winners short of two thousand. Is that very much something you want to tick off as soon as possible? Yeah, I'm looking forward to that, Bruce. Yeah, I think it's around 24 more winners to the 2000. So that 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 would be a pretty pretty special moment in my career. Yeah. And also, the big 4-0 is not too far around the corner. I hear M- much booked up by way of celebrations. Well, we had it all. Well, I say we. I said my my wife had it all planned. A uh, big party for the 40th and. Would you believe it? Because the COVID kicked in, I don't think it's going to happen now. So I, I don't think I'll lose much sleep over it, to be honest. <laughs> OK, well, you're, just ba- you're glad to be back. And obviously, talking of celebrations, your beloved Liverpool, while you were uh, having your rehab and getting back, that must have been a nice diversion to watch the, the guys in red, your beloved Reds, finally get the job done. Yeah, it, I think it certainly helped the rehab. Um, it, it, it was a pleasure to, to watch them um, every every week and... Yeah, I've been a, a Liverpool supporter um, all my life, and my my two boys are Liverpool supporters. And they had no say in that, I'm afraid. So it's been fantastic. I'm very, very proud of them. Brilliant. Okay, Paul. Before we go, Kills, you were just saying before on air that uh, Paul Hannigan rode one of your favourite ever winners. Didn't oh you? yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, probably, probably one of my favourite. Yeah, one of those ones that you think. You know, I thought this was an absolute certainty. Nobody else did. Barsheba, one when she won her first Lancashire Oak, she was twenty five to one in the morning. Uh, and all she had to do was not be too keen. Now, if you remember, she was very keen, wasn't she, Paul, in the, in the early stages there, but nowhere near as keen as she had been in the hard work the time before, and she hacked up just as I thought she would. Happy memories there, Paul? Yeah, very, uh, yeah. So I think the reason why she was so keen because she, she only had one one eye, and I think she used to panic when she when she got a glimpse of the other runners, so absolutely right Paul the, the, the key was to settle her and luckily she did that day and uh, yeah it was a good win for David Ellsworth excellent we will be talking about some of Paul's other horses that he's ridden down the years and we will also be looking at some of the great horses trained in Yorkshire loads coming up on what a shout and if you haven't signed up yet to bet 365 we've got a great offer for you just use the code shout 365, the minimum deposit is £5 and you can get up to £100 in bet credits. Time for the hot topic then. And obviously it is York Festival. It's the Ebor Festival at York. So let's look at some of the great horses trained in the county of Yorkshire and where better to start than the lovely Lauren's six-time Group 1 winner. And there's been a beautiful video produced by Bet365 paying tribute to this wonderful filly Let's have a look at that now. This Lawrence against the running round. She's so tough though, she's seeing them off. Lawrence is in front of Temtem. Lawrence is a superstar from day one, really. She turned up Anna Sunstrom from France, prepped her. It was the first time she'd consigned horses to Doncaster sales to, to Goffs UK. Lawrence was a standout at the sale. I mean, she was a beauty queen as a, as a year, and I've got a picture in my office, and you can see that she looks a superstar, just stood waiting to go in the ring. I made sure I was glued to John while he was bidding, because <laughs> he had a number of trainers that were after her, and uh, thankfully he sent her to us. She was great to ride in, you know, in the box. She did have her days where you'd need to up your health insurance to get in with her. Her attitude was, was massive. Her stride length was, you know, compared to any other two-year-old in Carl's at that time, She'd been working with older fillies because the two-year-olds couldn't lay up with her. We knew she had a great career ahead of her. They were all fantastic, obviously, the group ones. The one that really stands out was the fillies mild. They're off. It was her first group one, and it was a stunning performance. And it's still PJ McDonald on Lawrence on the right. She got out, and she just galloped up that, that rail, and she, she just galloped them into the ground. Lawrence is in front of the approach to winning line. September joined her on the line. 
we were a little bit under the radar going into that, so that was that was a fantastic effort. To win a Group 1 Classic over a mile two and a half was a fantastic credit to her. I think the pre-Diane, that was probably a highlight for me. And I thought she was beat three times up the straight. She was so brave. She showed great boot and her, her guts in the finish of that race was a real attribute to what she was as a racehorse, you know. The decision to send uh, Lawrence to stud. I know there was good discussion about who to go to. We all sort of sat down and thought one thing that Lawrence lacked was a real sharp turn of foot. We were looking for a stallion that can put some instant acceleration into a Invincible Spirit has been a, a superb sire and um, I'm sure he'll uh, be a great cross with her. I'm really looking forward to seeing what she can produce. Hopefully they have her looks and, and ability. We don't know yet whether it's a colt or a filly, but John has said whatever the first one is, he's keeping. So hopefully, he's said it's coming here, so I hope it does. There were so many good memories. She proved to me that given a horse that good that I could compete with the best jockeys, to be associated with her was magnificent for me and it was a pleasure. Pat Cooney, lovely stuff there, lovely memories. She really was some filly. And I guess she's one of those ones that the public latched onto, didn't they? I mean, I bet when she won, it used to cost the bookies a few quid, didn't it? Yeah, I remember being at Newmarket when the first time we sponsored the Bet365 Spillies Mile, the first Group 1 race we ever sponsored. And I went into the parade ring and uh, she really, really took the eye. There was Aidan O'Brien runners, you know, all the top stables were there, but she stood out. She looked an absolute million dollars. She won by a nose. I backed the runner up September, and we all thought September had got up that day. And you knew then she was 10 to 1 that day, but then the public did really latch on to her, and why not? Her CV was excellent, wasn't it? And a uh, very, very popular horse, and rightly so. And, of course, every time she did walk into the parade ring, her price seemed to shorten even more because she is a stunning-looking filly. Yeah, I mean, I, I I tend to think that all racehorses look the same, but I think with Lawrence, you could tell, couldn't you, Kills? There was yeah, something about and yeah. wasn't she? Not not only did she look a million dollars, she had a big heart, didn't she? Yeah, she, that, 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 that's what endears punters to horses, isn't it, I think? I mean, she just tried her best every single time, right? you know what I mean? And, and, you know, she won loads of decent races as well. Like, you know, so, yeah, you couldn't knock her at all. She also she also had an owner, John Dance, who, who was very enthusiastic, uh, always on hand to chat to the media as well. That helped. You know what I mean? Because you know he wasn't, you know, he wasn't your shakes or your, your big owners that uh, they've got loads of horses. It was a, a sort of one-off for him to have a horse that good, right? you know. And uh, yeah, it was just a perfect story. Really. And also, Paul, looking at that film, it reminds you of, of what a big part of the Lawrence story P.J. McDonald was, because he, you know, that really was the making of him, as he said there. And he's some rider, isn't he, Paul? Yeah, and a good lad to boot as well, Bruce. Um, he's, uh, I, I think. You know, you need. I think there's probably this probably the kickoff to his career, really, um, Lawrence. I mean, I think he won four out of the six Group Ones on her, and um, every jockey will tell you that you need that stepping stone just to get you up up the ladder. And I think this was this was the one for him. Absolutely. Now you're from the other side of the Pennines, Paul. But as we said, because it's York uh, Festival Week. Let's look at some of the great horses trained in Yorkshire. When you think about it, there's just been so many, hasn't there? I mean, my first, some of my first memories when I first got into uh, uh, racing were really about the Yorkshire jumpers, your sea pigeons and those kind of horses. But there was a sprinter called Sober. You, would you remember Sober? Kills? I just be before only, your time. only just. Trained only by just. David Chapman. She was pretty hopeless at two. She mm. cost absolute buttons. But at three, she just became this absolute superstar. I think she won 12 races, including mm. the Stewards' Cup. Mm. Had it not been for Habibti coming on, she would have been champion yeah. sprinter. It was one of the great racing rags to riches <laughs> stories. So she's the one that always resonated with me. Kills, you've got a couple well, of I've old favourites. I mean, yeah, I've got old right favourites. They're not, you know, I mean, David, David Chapman, funny enough, I mean, he trained Chaplin's Club, didn't he? You know, Chaplin's Club won nine races in the season twice, and he did seven of them in like 19 days one year, like, you know, I mean, which is ridiculous. Uh, but. Um, Personal favourite was a horse trained by Richard Fay called Heaven's Guest. Now he wasn't top class, but he was a brilliant, uh, brilliantly consistent handicapper. I think he won, he, he won two big handicaps at Asker. He won two big handicaps at Newmarket, Bunbury Cup, and a three-year-old sprint. And he also won on Oaks Day at Epsom. Uh, and he was one of those horses that I had to back him whenever he ran. Didn't matter what price he was, what he was running in. You know, if he won, I, if, I had to have something on him. Sentimental. Uh, other one, Bordler Scott won two Nunthorpes. Uh, now, the funny thing about Bordler Scott is until Batash broke Dejour's 30-year-old track record, the fastest ever time for the Nunthorpe was run by Bordler Scott at Newmarket, 
uh, the year they had it at, Norm at Newmarket. Everyone can think Newmarket is a stiff track, but it isn't. Most, it's mostly downhill, but it has an uphill finish. Uh, so, yeah, he, he had that to his name, the fastest ever yeah. non-talk. Um, yeah, there's always been a north-south divide, obviously. We don't get so many good horses up there. And it, it, it's literally, uh, I think it, it, it's, it's a lot of snobbery because, you, you know, why haven't the big owners got horses with Richard Fahey and, and the like? You don't train 200 winners in the north. Uh, if you're not an absolutely top class trainer, do you? But I mean, in, we talk about classics. We've had Mr. Bailey's as my guineas, and we've had, uh, I think, Bolin Eric won a St. Ledger uh, for Tim Easterby. But before, after that, you've got to go back to 1977, I think, when Mick Easterby won uh, the 1000 with Mrs. McCarty. Mm -hmm. uh, so not many classic winners, but there's no doubt there are top trainers uh, up in the north, and if they're given the ammunition, they'd be training them. Absolutely. Pat, when you cast your mind back to all those great Yorkshire horses that we've seen down the years, who, who, who stands out for you? Probably the one I initially thought of was Sea Pigeon, of course, who did win the Ebor as well as the champion hurdle. But I was always a great uh, Mary Reevely fan growing up. And Malotti, I always thought, was a wonderful handicapper. Uh, very nearly won at Cambridgeshire and so forth. But uh, any horse Mary Reevely had seemed to be very popular in our household. Cab on Target, another one. And I, I think they've often underlooked in the betting. They have been for years and years. So, you know, as, as Keel says, they can train these people. So, um, you know, they, they can still win. But they often get overlooked. I think we, as odds compilers, you tend to look at the more higher profile yards. But um, there, there is a value edge back in northern horses, that's for sure. Oh, no question. And, Paul, obviously you've ridden, you know, for Richard Farr, you've ridden down in Newmarket. Do you detect that kind of snobbery as well? Or do you think times are changing? Because, I mean, some of these yards now in Yorkshire, some of these big flat yards... They're real powerhouses, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. Um, that, it was a bit of a shock to the system when I moved down to Newmarket, really. It was like a different language, to be honest, when I moved there. But uh, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is frustrating um, sometimes to see. But um, I think Rich has just, just showed in the past um, what, what, what he can do when he, when he, when he, when he gets good horses. So, um, yeah, well, Heaven's hope, hope, Guest be a horse that you, you had an association with? Yeah, I've been lucky enough to um, have an association with, uh, with, with, with many good horses. Uh, Bassett, along with it must have been uh, a nice one, Paul. Was Wharton Bassett's Wharton Bassett. top of the list. Yeah, yeah Wharton Bassett's yeah. top of the list. Yeah, and it's funny you mention that, Paul, because he's been in the news lately, hasn't he? Um, he's just been bought by Kilmore. Well, um, he was a side of Almond's or wasn't he? That's like, right. He was absolutely top class, one of the best around a few years ago, wasn't he? So he did well, yeah. didn't he? Well, it's did, fantastic did he just not train on at three, do you think, or did he have problems? He, he, I think it was a bit of both, in all honesty. He, he, he had a few problems, and he just didn't really have that zip. I mean, we did try to make him stay. Um, I think it was the French Guineas. Yeah. And he, he, he was really, um, that horse was all speed. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was been very lucky, been very lucky to ride good horses like him. Brilliant stuff, Paul. Well, we've had already two fantastic days at York. Let's look back on some of the highlights. Paul Hannigan, first up, when we look back on what we've seen so far at York, I want to know what it's like um, for the lads in the weighing room who aren't riding in the Yorkshire Oaks when you see Love produce that performance. Jewel, Jewel, I guess you're obviously all glued to the TV. Is there much chat afterwards? Jewel, kind of, you know, wow, that was incredible. What's what's it like? I'd love to know how, how it all pans out in the weighing room there. It was a little bit like that, in all honesty, Bruce. I mean, we're all kind of gathered around uh, the TVs watching it and probably a little bit jealous as well <laughs> watching it <laughs> wishing we were wishing we were out there but um, she was beautiful wasn't she wasn't that a great performance it, I don't think you could describe it any better it, it just was beautiful to watch it was just kind of uncomplicated how how every jockey wants it kind of to go and you just I think you just got to really appreciate you know when 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 you get days like that and I think that's how we were all thinking absolutely fantastic and Pat, you know, with Love um, performing so well on Thursday and, and Gayath being the star of Wednesday, things are boiling up towards the end of the season, aren't they? What did you make of Gayath, Pat Cooney? I thought he was very, very likeable. He, he must take an awful lot out of himself to keep winning the way he does, though. But the speed gurus are all over him, aren't they? And he just, he just powers along. You think two out, they're going to get near to him, and then he just grinds them again. So... Uh, just a wonderful racehorse, but uh, I, you, you do get worried. He, he, it must be a tough race he has every single time. He doesn't sell, give himself an easy time of it by any means, but it's been a real revelation. I think we all started the year off thinking 
yeah, he's a bit in and out. He blows hot and cold. The arc run wouldn't thrill too many people. But uh, he's just uh, really kicked on in uh, 2020. And uh, I, I think he's probably just about the highest rated horse in the world at the moment. But um, I think people have probably back love to beat him over a mile and a half. Absolutely. And Kills, I just want to touch on the ledger with you, please. Because Pile Driver, I mean, if you take his derby run out, he's, he's, he's won his last two very impressively and probably should be favourite for the ledger. But he's not, is he? Yeah, should he be? I mean, it's one of those. I mean, he's not really bred to get a mile and a half, I don't think. But, but you know, I mean, he was very strong at the end of the race. Uh, he's, he's, look, I mean, that is probably, other than Serpentine, is probably the best performance uh, by a three-year-old colt, colt over middle distances this season. So he's got to be a massive player. And nice to see a smaller yard yeah, sticking up to yeah, the big guns Yeah, you do like well. to see a smaller yard. You know, I backed one a few years ago, um, Harbour Law, Law among them. Uh, Did you? One the, one 50 to 1? Yeah, yeah, I tipped it in the weekend. I just want to get that into a bit, bit of after timing. <laughs> Kills does love dining out on a winning tip with a bar Shiva and now that, honestly. Right, let's see if he can tip some winners for some of the big weekends races. Yeah, that's the problem. Okay, Ebor Day at York on Saturday. We will touch upon the big race itself in a jiffy, but first of all, there's two really good supporting races at 3 o'clock. It's the City of York Stakes. And one master, that fabulously tough and consistent mare of William Haggerty's, heads the bet betting in this race. She won a Group 3 at Goodwood last time. Do you think she's favourite to follow up here, Kills? Are you going to go with her or are you going to look elsewhere? Yeah, no, I like one master. I think she's really good. I think she's a genuine Group 1 filly, basically. And she dropped, she dropped out of Group 1 company for the first time in, in, in a fair while when she ran at Goodwood. And she got Tom Marcand out of a hole. I'm not saying he did anything wrong. Horses tend to have to get you out of a hole when it comes to Goodwood, don't they? And it's because he had to sit and wait and wait and wait. And then, you know, that push button acceleration was there. She just got up on the line. She was mild, by miles the best horse in the race. This is tougher, but she has got a change of gear. And I think seven furlongs is absolutely her trip. Uh, she obviously finished second in the champion sprint on heavy ground last year, but she handles fast ground fine. She's been second in group ones on fast ground. Um, I think she's very much the one to beat. I think San Donato is pretty fast. I think coming back to seven furlong will suit him. Um, I do think one master is a very solid favourite. One master for kills. Who for Pat Cooney? Uh, I keep looking at uh, San Donato and the great day has come for this horse. He's dropping down to seven furlongs uh, for the first time since his juvenile days. Everything about him says he's not quite a mile. I, I think even though he was beaten eight lengths at uh, Glorious Goodwood last time, he showed enough to suggest the ability is there. The drop down to seven could be his ideal set of circumstances. I get the one master, you know, of course, uh, it's wonderfully versatile, as is Safe Voyage, the other one. But uh, they're six and they're seven. San Donato's a lightly raised four-year-old. I think the seven furlongs could be right up his street. And Paul Hannigan, who would you like to be climbing aboard in this race? I really can't see past one master, Bruce. Um, I mean, still to look at that race at Goodwood now, I still don't quite know how it gets up to win. Um, like Paul says, you need that bit of luck to get you out of the hole at Goodwood. But I, I still think it did extremely, extremely well to, to win at Goodwood. Paul, just tell me this. What's an easier track to ride, Goodwood or York? It's probably a silly question. I'd imagine it's York, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I, I've had some pretty frustrating times at both places, but... More, more would be a good, good word, to be honest. Um, and, I mean, I guess and, you have to go into the glorious meeting just accepting that you're going to get some that, you know, you just leave behind and others you're going to get a wonderful break and, and think, how did I win that? You've just got to accept Goodwood. And I think if you start changing things at Goodwood and you think, oh, I'll do this and oh, I'll, I'll, I'll come wide now, that's when it really starts to go wrong, you know, when you stop believing in yourself. But um, usually at, at York... There's not many hard luck stories saying that sometimes when they do stay up against that far rail, that can be just as bad as Goodwood, in all honesty, some days. Yeah, funny enough, Paul, I, I mean, they, they sort of shied away from the far rail. It looks like, um, sorry, sorry they've, shied, they've shied away from the near side this year. It looks like the far side, for the first time this season, is, is a better place to be. But they pushed the rail out six metres today and it's going out again tomorrow. Do you think that'll make the difference for the rest of the meeting? It, it's frustrating, Paul, when, when when I see it, when I see horses, you know, coming all the way over to this stand side. Um, I, I really don't think there's there's much in it. And nine times out of ten, you kind of see the horse always comes in the end about two or three or four near enough up the middle. Um, mm. That that usually comes and wins the race. So I really, I think, I think there's a big thing made out of nothing, really. Right. Yep. <laughs> two votes then for one master and one for San Donato in the city of York. 
the 225 at York on Saturday, the Skybet Melrose Stakes. It is a heritage handicap, fiercely competitive, and kills. I mean, I've never seen, if you're a form figures fan in this race, you don't know where to turn. They've all got ones and twos. By yeah, the I mean, it's, it's like that. I mean, the Melrose is, is, you know, it's always been a big target handicap for three year olds. So, you know, they, they, they plot their way and. Uh, and they won their races. Uh, most of them are stepping up in trip. They they've all looked very promising. It is difficult, yeah. Do you fancy telling us who you think might win it? Uh, yeah, I think William Agus might win it, but not necessarily with favourite Moon. Now he's he's favourite. He obviously beat Subjectivist uh, last time out. He was getting absolute chunks of weight when Subjectivist went on to run uh, second in the Gordon Stakes at York. But I, I, I thought that was a funny race to be honest, and he, he didn't uh, repeat that sort of form at. Uh, uh, in, in the Voltiger, so uh, I think he's a bit too short, and I like a star above. We're talking about trouble at Goodwood. Um, now it was just a case of Holly Doyle just was waiting to get a run and just couldn't. Right, and the horse wasn't helping her, uh, and she didn't get out in time. And she let Mambo Knights, who's running in the race as well, get first run, but was finishing really well, but still hanging on the track. And I think uh, this flatter track will suit miles better. I think it'll stay as well. Uh, and I think he'll go very close. And you know, William Agus won the race last year with Hamish, and I think the star above it is a major player. Excellent, Paul Hannigan. Has Melrose been a lucky race for you down the years? Um, I've had a couple of places uh, come close a few times, but not managed to to win it, Bruce. Um, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because as Kiel says, you've got all these emerging three-year-olds. So who, who are you going to uh, pin your colours to this time? <laughs> Yeah, I quite. I, I mean, obviously, I think it stands out to everyone, but I think Mambo Knight's gone for the four timer of uh, Richard Hannon. I mean, I know, I know he's probably carrying top weight and he's giving a lot of weight away, but I think he goes there in form, trainers in form. Um, so I, I think, I think he'll go very close. Okay, and Pat, your selection is. Uh, I'm going to the Kips of uh, Huey Morrison. A bit of a disaster. This was last time out at Newmarket. It was good to soft. He had blinkers on for the first time. And it was 10 furlongs, so just pretend it never happened. His time before was he was second at Royal Ascot to Hookham, who came out and frank the form a week ago at Newbury. That was a mile and a half on better ground. Maybe a mile six, no blinkers, goodish ground, Ryan War. That's an awful lot of boxes you're ticking there. So I'll go with Kips, but I would say Favourite Moon has been very strongly fancied. Once we've got the final decks out, we were four, we went, and we've laid them all the way down to three. I wouldn't imagine they get much shorter than that. But I, I like the Royal Ascot version of Kips rather than the Newmarket one. OK, and Paul, coming back to you, how is the track riding? It was obviously a bit of cut on, on Wednesday. It dried out yesterday. Are you expecting it to be just pretty much perfect, good ground for Saturday? Bruce, I think it's just going to be a little bit dead. Um, what happened was the first day um, was bright sunshine, then got a, a, a bit of a downpour um, through the middle of the card and then come sunlight again. You know, it, it, it's, it's very... Very hard for the people there, but I would say it's probably just on the slow side of good. So, so in other words, horses that do like a bit of cut, they're not completely ruled out of contention, no? Absolutely not, no. I think it would probably sound crazy, but if, it, if they just got probably another little bit of a downpour, it, it, it would do it good. They could just get through it a bit better. Cheers, Paul Hannigan. Let's do the big shouts next. OK, time for the big calls, where the three chaps get a chance to get something off their chest. Actually, I've got a chance as well, and I'm going to say this. I think now we're in a position where we can start getting people back to the race course. We don't want to rush. We've got to take the steps back to normality cautiously and sensibly. But surely now we can start getting crowds, not the whole shebang, but we can start bit by bit getting the public, the race goers, the bookmakers back into race courses. It's outdoors. Everyone's going to be sensible. Everyone's going to take precautions. It is heartbreaking to see meetings like the Ebor Festival taking place behind closed doors. Come on, let's start moving. Let's start getting back to normal. Paul Keeley. Yeah, I, well, I agree with all of that to start with. Um, you know, you see pictures every year of, of people camping outside to get into Wimbledon. I'm now at the stage where I would camp outside a race course if I could get in. Like, you know, I haven't been racing since, since the Cheltenham Festival when I just can't wait to go again. I love it. Uh, and, you know, I've just missed it. It's been, you know, a horrible year for not doing what you really like to do. Uh, but we go, my, my big call uh, is quite simple. Love is 6-4 to four for the arc. Gayaf is 6-1. to one. That, I'm afraid, is absolute nonsense. 
uh, and we've got Enable at Fleetwood. Gayath is now the best racehorse in the world, and I, I can't believe people aren't starting to believe in him. He's run to Racing Post ratings of 125, 129, and now 131. Now, the benchmark for me with brilliance is 130 or more on, on, the, on the Racing Post scale, and he's now at it. Right? There have only been, I've written them down, there have only been, I think it's nine horses since 2007 that have run a middle distance RPR in Britain of 130 or higher on good or faster ground. Go on, rattle through right. them. Manduro, Dylan Thomas, Authorised, New Approach, Rip Van Winkle, See the Stars, Frankel, Golden Horn and Harbinger. Four of those horses ran in the arc, three of them won. The other one went off 11 to 10 favourite. That was Authorised, he got beat. But he the, bombed the, last year, explain he, that. He bombed last year because he wasn't the horse he is now. I mean, you know, last year he, you know, he, he, he won really easily, then he, then he bombed a little bit at Longchamp and then he won really easily in Germany, and then he bombed again. Right? But he has won at Longchamp, so it's not a course thing. Uh, but now he's just grown up. He's a man now, you know what I mean? And he's the best racehorse in the world. And he's going to go there with by far the best form of any horse running. Uh, and he's not even second favourite because Enable is favourite. Look, you know, Enable may not have been that fit, but he still thrashed her uh, at Sandown. He's the best horse in the world. He's six to one. Uh, that is a stupid price. Kills is very convincing. When he gets on one like that, you kind of feel like you've got to go with it. Pat Cooney, what have, do you want to get off your chest today? Well, my faith in uh, racing was a little bit restored the last couple of days at York, really. And, and it's just a tribute to the smaller owners. We've had Pile Driver, who won so well. He led out unsold at the sales for 10 grand. And we had the winner of the group race yesterday, the opener, Miss Amulet. She was bought for seven and a half grand. So you tend to think of racing at York, the boot races, as the, you know, the same old faces there. But how about that? One that unsold for 10 and the other for seven and a half. Not being sceptical, it was a success story at the early part of the year. So it can still be done. So uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a future in racing for the smaller owner, which I'm thrilled about. But as with owners, I still can't get my head around. 300 are allowed in the Crucible for the snooker final. And none of us can go into the horse racing outdoors. Hard, hard one to argue, that one. Yeah, it absolutely. Look, I mean, the government have obviously got bigger fish to fry than worrying about race goers. But, you know, th there needs to be some consistency. And as you say, 300 people coughing through a frame of snooker indoors uh, <laughs> seems to carry a little bit more risk than 300 people wandering around the vast expanses of York. Paul Hannigan, you're a very mild mannered man. I don't expect you to start thumping your chest and shouting like John McCrip. But what would you like to tell us, my friend? Uh, my big call, Bruce, would be probably from a jockey's point of view is to try and keep this real, to keep jockeys riding at one meeting a day. Um, I think I was a bit worried it would it could only be a matter of time where there's going to be a serious accident. You know, jockeys driving from one meeting to another. Me personally, some of the things I've I've done trying to get to that meeting in time, I'd probably be locked up if, it, if I told you a few of the things that I did in the car. Um and nine times out of ten, you get there with a minute to spare and and you give it probably one of the worst rides in history because your head's still on the M25 or the M62. Um, so I think that's pretty important that, that they do keep that real for jockeys to ride for one meeting. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think anyone would argue with well, that. Yeah, kills, I, would I would ask, is it viable when we go back to six races a day and one, maybe two races are, are for apprentices, uh, amateurs or whatever, is it viable for your, your sort of journeyman jockeys who don't pick up that many rides anyway? I mean, this is the point. They might say, you, you know, I've got to go, I've got to go here and there to actually earn some money, uh, you know. Or now that we've now that we've got this situation, we've got COVID. Is it worth looking at what we do with racing? Maybe we should have less meetings, but ten race cards at these meetings instead. I'd agree completely. I mean, I'd hate to go back to six race meetings. There's only seven at York last couple of days, and that seems <laughs> well, odd, yeah, doesn't exactly, it? Yeah, but, 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 but Paul, going back to what you're saying, and I think everyone would agree, is it almost the case that if you impose that rule, you're saving the jockeys from themselves in a way? I mean, you're, you're taking that decision out of the jockeys' hands. And do you think that the, the PGAA and Paul Struthers would support it? Well, I think it's a very good point what Paul made. You know, it's, it's much easier for it now, isn't it, with 10 race card? Maybe they should look at keeping that 10 race card, but I think it sh I think it should really be taken out of the jockey's hands. I think a lot of pressure is being put on them. You know, if I don't make this ride, if I don't make that meeting, I'm not going to ride it again. You know, and, it, and I think it, it's putting far too much pressure. And as I say, I'm worried about there's going to be an accident and we're, I'm, everyone's going to be saying then we should have done it. Yeah, I think that's right. Foresight, always better than hindsight. That is a great shout by Paul Hannigan.
Right then, the big race of the weekend is the 340 at York on Saturday. It's a Skybet Ebor. Always a fascinating race, one which every racing fan looks forward to. And as ever this year, ludicrously competitive, difficult to find the winner. So Paul Hannigan, lead on, my friend. Show us what a good tips do you are. I think I'm struggling already, really. Just looking at it, it's probably the most competitive race of, of the season. Um I mean, I'll, I'll take a bit of a chance, but she's got to overcome uh, the draw of 21, and that's Monica Sheriff of William Haggis and Daniel Tudhope. Um, as I say, she's drawn in the car park, and I've been drawn there before, and it's not easy, but I think if Danny Tudhope, which I think he could, he's uh, an excellent jockey, can uh, pull out a bit of magic, I think she's got an excellent chance. And what would you do if you were on her with that sort of challenge? Would you look to try and get an early posse or would you just take your medicine, drop her out and, and not pray, but hope the brakes go your way? I think the only problem with that, Bruce, is just York itself. I mean, it's just, for some reason, I don't quite know. It's just so difficult to come from that far behind. They generally just to keep going. So preferably I'd like to jump and slot in rather than try and miss the break and then, and then uh, get get in you know it's it's a difficult one I think really depends on on the pace of the race yeah I mean we haven't you're right we haven't in the first two days we've seen very few horses come from and one that did was you actually on board uh, I think she's called Uncle Thumb in the um in the Lowther that was a really good performance to finish third she looks half decent doesn't she yeah I still can't pronounce the name to be honest I've called her all all kinds of names but um she she's she, she's a very nice filly still very green and uh, I think that's probably, you're right, Bruce, it's probably the only one that, that that's really, really come home. So, something to look forward to. Absolutely. Good stuff. Pat Cooney, who wins the Ebor? Well, I think, uh, obviously, it's wide open, but Irish trainers have a good record in this. They've won it four times the last 10 years. So, you've got the likes of True Self from Willie Mullins, Pondas from Joseph O'Brien to consider as well. I think the each-way angle is going to be key to my way of thinking. Most firms are going to pay, you know, real fancy each-way terms on the race. So my eyes drawn to Vidana Blue, and I just keep looking at the looking at the mare, thinking, well, we know she's a wonderful hurdler and so forth. She was second at Royal Ascot, admittedly over the two miles. She only went up two pounds for that. She beat plenty of others in the race, and she looks the type that was sure to be running on, running on, running on. I'd be surprised if she was out the first five or six. So I'm sure there'd be some firms out there with very advantageous each way terms in the race. So I think she's bound to give you a return for your money at those terms. I think we were talking about that, Kills, this morning, weren't we, Vidana? I mean, you, you can see one or two beating her, but can you see half a dozen beating her? Yeah, that's if you're right. Not she's, she's, places? she's got a chance. She's going to be, she's be, going to be giving a hold up ride now. Um, you know, with me with my weather watch, like, you know, I mean, part of the reason the horses haven't become involved, there's been a fierce wind um, straight down the track. It's going to be going to be at its fastest today, I think. Um, but it's supposed to ease a bit. So it might that, that might help you, you hold up horses a little bit more. I think a long straight for Vidana Blue is going to suit very well. Uh, just going back to what Paul said about the draw, now it's funny, it's a bit sort of counterintuitive, just like Ascot over a mile and a half when you get a big field there, right? Um, Mustard Year won the race from stall two last year, but previous years, 21, 18, 12, 6, 16, 18, 16, 10, 22. You know, so they, they, an outside draw is not necessarily, you know, a lot of horses, they sort of come and get their position and then the ones on the inside getting in, are the ones that get in all the trouble, basically. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens, but uh, over the last few years, an outside draw has certainly not been a negative. In fact, it's been an advantage. Um, now, the horse I like is drawn 17. Um, it's called All Right Sunshine, trained by Keith Dalgleish, who's showing um, strong signs of coming back to form. It had a bit of a quiet spell, but they all seem to be running well now. Now, he ran in the race that the favourite, Fujay, you were Prince uh, won at uh, Royal Ascot, one of the new, uh, one of the new races there, and you never see a horse hitting so much trouble um, in a race. He got hampered at the start. He got hampered about three or four more times. He was still cantering two furlongs out and couldn't get a run. Um, didn't really pick up when he finally got out. But I mean, he'd been messed around so many times. I'm going to forgive him that. Uh, he he's basically run really well without being put in the race, without being able to be put in the race. He's, he he. Uh, I think he won three, three or four bumpers when he started. He won his four of his first seven flat races when he started. Uh, he's a strong traveller. I think he'll run a big race at a price. I've been backing him all season, and I was going to let him go this time, but I'm going to have to get involved. But my main fancy, and 
I don't know whether it's his heart ruling head. I don't think it is. I think he's got a form chance. The lovely Yukon Glenn, who's obviously <laughs> getting on now, isn't he? He had that very long um, absence, but he's come back really well. And he ran an absolute corker behind Stradivarius at Goodwood last time. I think on the weights, I mean, he's only got two or three below him in the handicap. He's not used to that. And I think Yukon Glenn will run a real blinder. Talking of blinders, we've got a great two-year-old contest next. Now then, Sunday's highlight. What a cracker over in Deauville. I think it's at 1.35. It's the pre morning Some of the best two-year-olds seen so far this year do battle on heavy ground. It's always so soft at Deauville. It's going to be a magnificent contest, this. Pat Cooney, this really will tell us something about what the real hierarchy is of the two-year-olds so far. Definitely. It's just a shame, isn't it? It's going to be on heavy ground. You you look at Campanell, Wesley Ward, you don't tend to think of American horses appreciating heavy ground on turf. But as soon as she won at Royal Ascot, Wesley was very quick to nominate this as her target race. So she's turning up. But I suppose you look at tactical, he, at least he's won on good to soft. We're the master of John Dance of Lawrence Spain. He won on good to soft first. I, I just hope it does prove to be a conclusive uh, race for us all to analyse the form going forward. I suppose I'll go with the Colt tactical, knowing that he's actually won with giving the ground. But uh, I don't know, Campanelle, she looked pretty smart the other day, didn't she, at Royal Ascot? She certainly did. Who do you fancy kills? She did, actually. Wesley Ward says he's not worried about the ground. Um, mm. Obviously, he thought he was going to be pretty soft at York, didn't he? And he, took, he, he said he wasn't going to run his two-year-old here, but he said he, he, he specifically said, I'm not worried about it for Campanelle. So, so you know, obviously, I don't think it was as heavy as it is now. Um, I think Tactical's a form horse. Uh, it's one of those races where we don't know too much about um, any of the others. And obviously, um, I was looking at the betting earlier, the, 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 the Fahey horse, um, um, Rhythm, what's it called? Uh, Rhythm Master. Um, very impressive first time up. I wonder if Paul could tell us a bit more about it, because there's obviously one run in, in, a, in a maiden, uh, but straight into Group 1. Can we tease a tip out of you first, Kills? Well, oh, Tactical's a form horse. You're going to go one. Tactical. But, but, you know, it's not a race I'm betting in. What do you make of the fire here, horse, uh, Paul? What's the word from uh, Musley Bank? I think he's a very good horse, Bruce. Yeah, I think he's a very good horse. Uh, this is a big test, though, isn't it? Because, you know, the front two have, have, have got the form in the book. But do you think he can improve past them? 100%, yeah. Um, I mean, I think it speaks volumes, Richard, taking it, oh, taking him over there on his, on, on his second outing. Um, the things you've got to think about, there's a question mark. I know he won on softest ground. It's not going to be anywhere near as soft as it is uh, in, in, in Deauville. And it's just the experience, really. But it certainly wouldn't surprise me to see him go very, very close in, uh, in, in this race. Excellent stuff. That's the pre-morning. Do watch that. That's going to be throwing lots and lots of clues for the two-year-old races this season and probably next year's classics. Time now for the My Racing Double. Those super shrewdies down at MyRacing.com have come up with two horses for what they believe is a great value double. The three o'clock, they've gone for Escobar. And in the 340, the Ebor, they've gone for Joseph O'Brien's Pondus. That's the My Racing Double. OK, let's get the best bets from our panel for the weekend. I'm going to kick off. We'll do the worst one first. It's the Strenzel Stakes at 150 at York on Saturday. And a... A strangely improving horse, because he's got so many miles on the course, is Pogo. Third in a group one in France last time. Really good run in the Royal Hunt Cup uh, behind Montham. That got Franks as well. So I think Pogo's a big price in the strength. Or Kills, who are you going to nap? Yeah, I'm going to go right to the last race of the day at York. And it's going to be a Northern winner. Mark Johnson trained Miras going down to five furlongs for the first time, raced ridiculously keenly and still won the, Stu uh, still won the Scottish Stewards Cup at Hamilton, then finished sixth in the Stewards Cup from the front. He just looks like he wants to go five furlongs and I don't think they'll get anywhere near him. Pat Cooney, who are you going for? I'm going off to Utoxter in the 210 and it's the John Joy O'Neill father and son combo, Skylana Breeze. Now, just watching this fellow 18 days ago, he absolutely trotted up in first time out cheap pieces, won very, very easily. The handicapper saw him as well. He put him up 10. But I was watching the race thinking, God, this horse could go up a stone or more. He's only gone up 10. He won in a hat canter that day. £10, not enough. I am expecting him to win tomorrow. And Paul Hannigan, we've loved having you on the show. You've been a what a, sh a shout star. See if you can put the cherry on the cake with a winning nap. Uh, yeah, my nap would be another far. He's runner in at Deauville, actually, the day before um, tomorrow. Uh, Fevrova. Runs in the uh, Calvados Group Two race. Uh, rode a, a rode her out 
quite a few times at home. She's in great form. Um, she will stay further than seven, but I think on that ground, it should probably suit. So, uh, yeah, Fev Rover uh, in in, Do- in Deauville on uh, Saturday. Excellent. Those are your naps. That's it for another great What A Shout. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to post your comments below. We'd love to know who you fancy this week. Good luck with your bets. Don't forget for the best possible help in finding the winners, download the fabulous free racing post app. And most of all, bet responsibly. Dave's back next week for another What A Shout. Mm -hmm.